Okay, let's see. Next one, um, the focus on precepts and number 62, the food you receive every day comes from blood, sweat, and bitter tears of hardworking farmers. Yes, like I said at the beginning, you guys are going to hit everything. <laughs> you know, one at a time. So yeah, this, this is for monks and it's trying to make really clear um, the, 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 what they owe and that they can't be complacent, that their job is to serve. Um, somebody is struck by how much what they heard is in uh, Zen Master Sung Sons, especially Compass of Zen. Compass of Zen was written to be a kind of descendant of this. This is Mirror of Zen. He wrote Compass of Zen, so it's very consciously, yes, and So San's teachings absolutely imbue, um, Korean, Korean Zen is imbued with So San. So San is all over Korean Zen, so yes. Um, what about the dichotomy between sudden enlightenment and the gradual process that may take years? The text seems to waver between these two ideas in unexpected ways. What's up with that? Again, you know, pointing to something that's really important here. So what's going on there is it's the, um, in both the Sutra school, the Kyo school, which is very um, important in Korea, and the Japanese Kaodong school, which we know as the Soto school, I mean, the Chinese Kaodong, which in Japan became Soto, um, there's this notion of enlightenment as something that takes place very, very gradually. And um, there's, you know, you just keep practicing and you keep practicing and then gradually you wake up. Whereas in the Lin Shi school and Korean Zen is Lin Shi, it's in the Lin Shi school related to Rinzai, there's this technique of uh, Kongans and Hua Do, which is slightly different. So Hua Do is when you, when your meditation practice is what am I? Or what is this? That's a Hua Do. And then in Kongans are the little stories that you um, are asked questions about. But it's related that your, your mind is brought to this very tight brink of like, whoa, you know, this don't know just really hits you. And then suddenly, boom, you explode. That's sudden enlightenment. And so um, it's, a, it's a question about the dichotomy between these two schools. And um, as with almost every Dharma book, this is in part a political document. He's trying to unify Korean Buddhism, the same as Chinul did, what, uh, 500 years earlier, 400 years earlier, something like that. He's trying to unify Korean Buddhism, but at the same time, he wants to speak to the primacy of his tradition. And so that's where this is coming from. And uh, Chinul's notion of, Chinul was 11th or 12th century, um, blocking. Um, Chinul's idea was you have the sudden enlightenment and then you continue practice and that enlightenment ripens. And so that's, that's so sun is very much in that tradition of you wake up, but that your job's not over. Your job is just started when you wake up and then you have to keep practicing and keep practicing and you let that ripen. So yeah. Um, is the one thing in the book the same as the Tao? How does this relate to Buddha nature? What a fabulous question. Um, what is the one thing? <laughs> you know, it's pointing to something, but you can't, you can't name it. You can't talk about it. You can't say it. So I don't really know what the Tao is. I'm not a Taoist. Um, but what is this one thing? That's really important. And it's not something that you can like look in the back of the book for an answer or, okay, write 15 words on what is the one thing. Check. You know, it's not like that. So it's this one thing that you look at and, and we'll talk about that or I will talk about that more uh, later. So how much should we carry the precepts in our minds or in our actions? You know? What is the role? I mean, this book is written for monastics. We're all lay people. And yet lay people have for centuries turned to this book. Um, it's a, I think you all agree, it's a very inspirational book. So yeah, how much should we carry the precepts in our minds? That's something we have to look at ourselves and how much in our minds and how much in our actions. Is it important if they're in our minds? If they're not in our actions, is it important if they're in our actions? Does it have to be in our minds? Yeah, that's a really good good thing to look at. And don't be attached to words and speech, but then describes it as sweet rain falling after a long drought, like encountering an old friend in a faraway land. So it seems to describe being wonderful, but 
look at what we're going through right now. We're going through this terrible pandemic and suffering. Um, that's a really important point. Um, so I want to take away, I want to sort of split this into parts. So don't become attached to words and speech. So that's throughout Sosan, and that's essential to the, the Zen project, if you want to say it, is cutting through thinking, always cutting through thinking. That's the difference between Sun and Kyo. You know, Sun is the Korean word for Zen. The difference between Sun and Kyo is Sun is always saying this um, non-attachment to language. And then, um, let's see, let's look at four. I want to see what that it is. Oh yeah, what is it? Uh, that it is waking up, okay? So when we wake up to our true nature, it's like sweet rain falling after a long drought, like encountering an ulcer in a faraway land. This is the place where I should say that he didn't write that poem. He hardly wrote any of this book. I'm going, going to go into this later. I have an article in Buddha Dharma about this. The standard way that you wrote texts back then is you took language and you sort of collaged it. And that was, that was the way most Buddhist texts were written. And you had to have this, it's not like cheating. It's like you had to really absorb what was said. You know, what you had to really absorb what you had read in order to weave it together that way. So almost none of the poems are attributable here to Sosun. They're mostly, he's either patching together something from one person, something from another person, or he's simply quoting a poem. Um, and the commentaries are like that, and the, the, um, the sort of main parts that he then comments, it's all like that. So I had to say that here, and I'll go back to that later. Um, and yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, he doesn't talk that much about suffering in this book, except when he talks about the body, you know, the body, how it suffers all the time. And when he also talks about the horrible things that'll happen to you, what hells you're gonna go into if you're a bad monk, you know? But he doesn't talk very much about sort of suffering that you see around you every day, which when you consider the times he was living in, you know, with the Japanese invasion and everything like that, with the um, Confucian um, uh, Confucian repression of Buddhism in the early part of his life. And when you think about that kind of stuff, it's interesting that it doesn't seem to work its way into this book very much. And that's all I can say about it. It's just interesting that it doesn't work its way in. But on the other hand, there is this recognition of suffering as an in integral part of being alive, you know, with his, his <laughs> rants about the body. <laughs> the body's so horrible. You have these, what is it, nine holes and things are always leaking out of them and blood and pus and pee and poop and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, good thing he wasn't a woman. Anyway, um, yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah. Thank you for the person who, brought that up. Um, okay, so this question, my question has to do with the commentary and the opening sentences of each section. Were the openings part of an oral tradition or were they part of the sutras? So I will simply read to you from Mueller's note, not Mueller, Jorgensen's, why did I say Mueller? From Jorgensen's note to the first to the opening, where did I, I copied it off somewhere. Oh, here we go. So let me remind you how it opens. I usually, I have it memorized, but I'll, you know, read it anyway, just so I don't make a mistake. Um, there is only one thing from the very beginning, infinitely bright and mysterious by nature. It was never born and it never dies. It cannot be described or given a name. Here is Jorgensen's, so who is Jorgensen? So John Jorgensen also translated, it's called A Handbook of Korean Zen Practice. 
Handbook of Korean Zen Practice. He translated, he wrote extensive notes. Here's the note. One thing, possibly in reference here to the verse of Huinang and the Zhangbo and Dei versions of the Platform Sutra, quote, Bodhi originally has no tree, the clear mirror also has no stand. Originally, there was not one thing, so Lord can be in the dust, see Ampolsky, etc. It is a reversal of Mazu Dai's. Here I do not even have one thing made in reply to Huao Hai in the whatever he, he gives a Chinese title, I can't read it. Uh, the Korean translation is no Chinese characters used. The first five characters translated is here. Start the preface by somebody in, and again, he gives the name in Korean, so I don't understand what it is. Oh, it's explanations of the five interpreters of Diamond Sutra. Very bright and very numinous, which is how he translates the next one. Comes from the instructions of the assembly in the Linji Ju, that's the Linji record. Um, to be very clear and definite, radiantly and vividly, cannot be named and cannot be described, refers to a passage in the extensive re record of Yunmen. Uh, that's Unmun. Unmun raised the words of Dong Shan. You must know there is a matter that improves on the Buddha. A monk asked, what is the matter that improves on the Buddha? Dong Shan said, not the Buddha. The master said it cannot be named, it cannot be described, which is why he said not the Buddha. So we have what, four or five sources? For that, three lines. Furthermore, those three lines are actually a summary of a major aspect of the awakening of faith, which is an important um, book in the Mahayana. I have it right here, The Awakening of Faith by attributed to Asvagosha. And it's a very, very important book in the Mahayana. And um, they talk a lot about this um, one mind and this one thing, rather, this one thing. And in some sense, I'm going to, now I'm going back to this issue of the one thing. In some sense, the mirror of Zen is taking this notion of the one thing and instead of making it an object for us to analyze, it's taking it as a ground which is no ground. Does that make sense? Doesn't matter if it makes sense. So, <laughs> so this is the, the, um, the Zen focus on the particular that you don't get caught up in the, in the kind of abstract picture, but you keep coming back to the particular. So you have this one thing that we are all aspects of, parts of, contributing to, however you want to call it. And this is a very, very important part of the Mahayana, this notion that, you know, it's, it's related to um, codependent origination and um, all this kind of, 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 you know, this deep, deep link, linkage. But on the same time, you don't make it into a thing that you're going to analyze and discourse about. So that's basically um, what that one, you know, there is only one thing from the very beginning. Yeah, there's only one thing from the very beginning and it's completely empty and it's Doug's orange shirt right there, you know, and his orange wall, you match today, Doug. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so that's, um, yeah, you can't really talk about it. If you talk about it, you pin it down. So don't pin it down. But if you're really caught by this question, what is this one thing? I encourage you to use it as a, an object of meditation, as a, as a wado. You know, that you sit there just, what is this one thing? What is this one thing? What is this one thing? You know, that's, that's what a wado is like. You just look at it. What is this? What is this one thing? What is this one thing? If it captures you, then try that as a meditation practice and see what happens. Um, so to go back to this, uh, where the opening's part of an oral 
tradition or were they part of the sutras? The whole thing is part of a whole lot of stuff. I mean, Jorgensen has, I'm trying to see how many notes. Jorgensen has, um, Six hundred and thirty-two notes on this itty bitty text. Now his text is slightly longer. Um, there are many versions uh, within ten years of its appearance. There were at least four different versions of the Mirror of Zen, and um, the one that we read, the Hyang Gox translation, is the shorter version. And then the longer version, which was earlier, um, has maybe about 20 or 30 more sections. Um, and that's the one that Jorgensen is. But so still it's not many pages and there are over 600 notes, you know. So it comes from a lot of places. Um, yeah, somebody says, please give me live words. I hope I'm doing it. <laughs> I don't know, you'll have to tell me later. Okay. So now here's a question that was asked privately and I said, may I ask it publicly? And the answer was yes. So um, it's about chapters 73 and 74 about not getting excited if you see the Buddha after death in a dying process. And this person had an earlier Hindu type teacher who said, well, if you see a deity figure after death, go for that. And don't go to your relatives and friends if you see that because that would mean a lower rebirth. And um, so this, this brings the notion of rebirth into, um, which was very important, you know. It, um, it was important to my teacher. It's uh, been very important in, um, in East Asian Buddhism and South Asian Buddhism. And uh, somehow in the West, we've um, sort of let most of us, not all of us, most of us have let go of that. And also in Asia, a lot of people have let go of it. I know a lot of Japanese teachers who, you know, Japanese in Japan who say, uh, you know, I don't care about rebirth. I don't believe in it. I don't know about it, whatever. But the, the question of where, you know, sort of what, what is the ultimate purpose of our life? You know, there you are, you're dying. You're, if you believe that, something is going to happen to you, what should you want that something to be? And what Sosan is saying, even in the moment of dying, give up all of your attachments, even to the Buddha. Just give up everything. Make your mind completely clear. Just completely clear. So clear that you're not attached to anything. Instead of wanting to be attached to a deity. And the, the best commentary on, on rebirth that um, I've ever heard was, um, actually there are two, but the, the one I want to mention here is uh, when Zen Master Sung San, and he actually was close to death, but no one realized it. He was had a very severe heart condition that developed while he was in Europe, and he was giving a Dharma talk. And then the next morning they had to rush him to the hospital because his lips were turning blue. Um, and that was when they discovered that he had some kind of heart failure. I think maybe it was congestive heart failure, I'm not sure. But anyway, and he was not that old. But anyway, uh, he's in Europe and, and I think in Germany and somebody says to him, well, you're a great Zen master. When you die, where do you go? And, um, you know, they expect him to say, oh, I go to the Tushita heaven, you know. But instead he said, oh, I die, go hell. And they're like, what? What do you mean you're going to go to hell? You're in great sense. says, yeah, go hell, start Zen Center. So that's a very clear mind, you know. It's not about me. It's like, oh, okay, I'm dying. Go to hell. They need me there, you know. So that mind. Um, the other thing I wanted, yeah, this is sort of besides the point, but a long time ago there were these um, Tibetan teachers who came to town. This would be like uh, 35 years ago, and they were giving a talk. Uh, somewhere and I was in the audience and um, you know I, I'd been practicing Zen for like about 10 years or something and, and um, maybe less than that anyway yeah about seven or eight years and um, and I said you know and of course being Tibetan they were very big on on rebirth and lineage and and 
incarnation and stuff like that. And so I raised my hand and said, well, if everything is empty, what is there to be reborn? And I was so clever. And he gave me this little spiel about emptiness, you know. Um, and so I went up afterwards. I said, look, I'm a Zen student. I understand emptiness. I can't believe I said that. You know, I'm a Zen student. I understand emptiness. Um, so what, what is there to be reborn? And the translator, you know, started to talk, but then the, the real teacher sort of grabbed me by the arm, you know, like this. And, you know, he grabbed me by the arm that did not have the sleeve on it. And then, cause you know, they always go with one shoulder bare. And then the other arm had the, a very big sleeve and he sort of, you know, went like this. He said, karma, karma, karma. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, that's all I'm gonna say about rebirth. So yeah, so thank you. That's a really great question. Um, okay, somebody's said it's striking how succinct it is. Yeah, that's really amazing. I mean, he's he's. If you look at Jorgensen's notes, he's taking this very complex literature and he's really boiling it down. It's it's kind of amazing. You know, it's like one of those sauces that you make where you take all kinds of things and you just cook it and cook it and cook it and refine it and refine it and refine it. And then you get this really like dense substance. That's what he's doing here. He's taking all this tradition, this Sun tradition, this broader Mahayana tradition, you know, the Sutra tradition, uh, even some Huayan, well, that's particularly sort of the Avatamsaka Sutra. And he's just boiling it down and boiling it down and boiling it down. And it's, it's kind of remarkable. Okay. Uh, what struck me in a question, the discussion of the ideal and the reality, especially in chapter 52, how might this infinite direction be part of our daily practice? So I'll remind you of that. Merely chanting with the lips is nothing more than recitation of the Buddha's name. Chanting with a one-pointed mind is true chanting. Just mouthing the words without mindfulness, absorbed in habitual thinking, will do no real good for your practice. And then you have this very long one, two, three, four and a half pages of commentary. You must have commentaries like a few lines, it's four and a half pages. This is politically very important, this section, because this is the stuff about reconciling Pure Land Buddhism and Sun Buddhism. Um, and this is something that um, was important in China, it was important in Korea, it was important in Japan, because they seem to be at opposite odds. You know, Pure Land is where you recite um, the, the um, um, Amida Buddha's name with the hope that you will be reborn in the pure land, which is not a place of like milk and honey. It's a place where you can really practice. That's why you want to be reborn in the pure land because the conditions for practice are better than they are here. So you can become a Buddha faster. And so you want to be reborn in the pure land. And so it's all this what's called other practice. Whereas Zen is not like that. Zen is like, you do it on your own. You're not asking for the intervention of Amida Buddha or any other Buddha. You're just, you know, you're just doing it on your own with the help of your Sangha, your friends and your teachers and, and the people around you. But, you know, basically you're doing it yourself. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can be an intermediary. And so you have these two strands of practice and how do they get along with each other? And how do they see each other? So what he's doing is he's acknowledging, you know, the bit about the 84,000 expedient means. He's acknowledging different strokes for different folks, that there are different ways people can approach, that they, there are different ways people have to approach things because people are different. And he's trying to come to some kind of accommodation, but he's also trying to say something to the Pure Land people, which is don't just do this, you know? You have to really do it from your there. You have to do it from your, you know, tangent, from your center. And he's also saying to the Zen practitioners, you know, if you just sit in silence all the time and you don't have any other practices, maybe that's not so good. So this recitation is actually helpful. If you do it correctly, this recitation is really helpful. So he's, he's trying to strike the balance here as he is in so many places. 
of how it's, if you do just chanting or just sutras or just sitting, you're losing something, that it's important to, to bring things together. Um, and yeah, so, and how might this infinite direction be part of our daily practice? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so we have to look at that in our own lives. You know, moment to moment, what is our direction? What are we doing? Especially right now when so many of us don't have anything on the outside to pull us. You know, moment to moment, what are we actually doing? And what is the direction? This, are we in touch with this, you know, infinite universe? Are we sort of, you know, just kind of caught you know so thank you so interpreting text and analyzing the meaning of words merely produces heaps of desire anger and ignorant mistaken views it's a quote and then this person says as i was reading i thought oh funny how i'm spending my time so yeah I, you know that's how we were spending our time this week i have to tell you i was doing worse because i had to compare these two texts and so i was going through them both simultaneously um, plus, you know, rereading introductions and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, so I was being very scholarly about, it. I mean, I have a page here where I, I, you know, um, compared like, oh, uh, number 22, the capping word is essentially your, uh, Jorgensen's number 36 rearranged and number 28 is half of Jorgensen's number 49, <laughs> this kind of stuff, which was weird. Um, but anyway, yeah, so yeah, we were, do so this, this, so this really brings about the question of which, you know, uh, Sosan talks about is what, what is the purpose? What is the, um, what is the place of reading, of scholarship, of sutras and commentaries in Zen practice? And he never says it's not essential. You know, he himself was the head of the of the sutra school for a while. So he had a obviously from the you know from Jorgensen's notes on the mirrors, and it's 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 obvious that he had a huge huge knowledge of this stuff. I mean, he had absorbed it totally. Um, but it's the purpose is not dry analysis. So when we read this stuff, and oh, I've got three new messages. I want to check because maybe somebody, maybe somebody. Um, okay, all right. I have to go back to where this was. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to. The way Sosan puts it is that you have to take the um take the words and not analyze them but sort of let you live within you you have to absorb them so their true meaning becomes apparent and the way i like to put it is if when you're reading a buddhist book it doesn't inspire you to practice then don't read it now, I find that Sosan really inspires me. I've taken Sosan with me as a companion. I've done, I'm not sure how many, four or five, like three or four week retreats and um, one 90 day solo retreat, you know, these solo retreats. And when you do a solo retreat, it's very helpful to have, um, have some kind of text with you because you don't have a teacher, you don't have other students. So you need something to bring you out of yourself when you start going into your stories, you know, which you do. I mean, that's a big part of it. You go into your stories and you've got to figure out how to come out of them. And, um, and Sosan really helps with that. You know, you, you can just open it up at random and you'll find something and go, oh, right. So for me, Sosan is a deeply inspirational text. And for many people, it is. That's why it's so wildly popular. I mean, it was not only read in Korea, but it was read in Japan, which is very interesting. Um, 
and it's read by monastics and it's read by lay people. It's an important part of monastic training, even today in Korea. Um, it, it has a gazillion translations, except not that many into English. I only know of these two. Um, so, yeah, so um, funny how I'm spending my time. If reading this inspires you, then great. And that's really what all these texts are for. They're all, they're all texts meant to inspire, meant to point us to our practice. Um, yeah. So here's a comment about the Gothas. Um, so I thought the Gothas were particularly beautiful. As we know, they come from all kinds of places. So I thought about number 55 a lot. Number 55 is uh, using clever words and eloquent speech to show off to others your knowledge of the Dharma, especially if you have not any, had any awakening, is like colorfully painting a stinking outhouse to make it look like a temple. Yeah, right. Um, what more can one say? And then the two gatas that you like are number eight and number 75. Number eight, seeing layer upon layer of mountains and flowing streams is itself my clear and bright original home. Is that one of the ones that I, no, that's not one of the ones that I mentioned. And uh, number 75, there's somewhere in my notes, I, I wrote the source of the gata, but that's not that one. If you do not cross the meadow thickly covered in weeds, you will never reach the village dusted with falling blossoms. Maybe that's getting close to suffering, I don't know. Maybe that's saying you have to suffer in order to wake up, but, um, but that's still not touching what suffering is. So let me see, that's number 75. Um, nope, don't have a note on that either. Um, but yeah, yeah, some of these gatas are really great. Yeah. Um, somebody says, I really wish we could like people's statements. And I wrote back to that person, I like everyone's statement. Um, and someone said, the sutra emphasizes that every condition experienced in the present is but a direct reflection of conditions experienced or acted upon in the past. Wow. So thank you for your comment. Um, what struck me was that the book is a representation of the circle. Um, and that then, and yeah, that's, that's a nice way to put it because it does come back to itself. You know, in the very end, he says, oh, this is what I said in the next last set. Oh, this is what I was talking about in number two. And then the last one says, oh, this is what I was talking about in number one. So he does sort of come back to that. Um, and maybe we'll have time to talk about the arch of the, the structure of this. Um, so in number 73, so I'm going to go to 73 and you should too. In number 73, okay, so that's in the hour of your death, simply perceive the five skandhas are intrinsically empty. The four elements composing this body have no eye. Our true nature has no mark, shape, or form, does not come or go, appear or disappear when your body was born. That's interesting because that's very similar to the opening, right? True nature has no mark, shape, form, does not come or go, appear or disappear when your body was born. True nature is not born. When you die, true nature does not die. Perfectly quiescent and still in mind and obvious are not two things. If you can attain to this realization in an instant, you are no longer bound or deceived by cause and effect in the three worlds of desire, form, and formlessness. Such a one can truly be called free, one who has really transcended the world and all that. Though the Buddha appears, this person is not excited. When even hell appears, he is not fearful in the least. That goes back to what I was saying about um, Zen Master Sung San asked where he goes when he dies. Attaining new, no mind, you and the whole universe are never separate. This is a very important thing to realize. Every day of your life, you unknowingly sow seeds of karma and the fruit appears at death. Whoever does not open their eyes and look closely at this is indeed foolish in the extremes. And the question is, are impulses different from karma? So what are impulses as a skanda and what is karma? So karma is this causality. Um, and then uh, impulses is not quite the same as karma. Impulses is um, the thought before the action. So for example, they've, they've um, 
they've uh, done measurements, uh, you know, in people's brains and muscles and things like that, and discovered that the muscle starts to move before you have a conscious thought of the muscle moving. So that's where, am I wrong or am I right? Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so it's, um, so that's basically what, what impulses means. Um, so impulses is different from, from, uh, from karma and impulses in a, that's what impulses mean in the skanda. It's the, the pre-action. Um, Chapter 73, every day unknowingly so, oh wait, I wanted to say something more about this. Um, no, I guess, I guess I said that, yeah. Right. Oh yeah, no, I know what I wanted to say. Um, oh, maybe it's somewhere else. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the notion of free, there's a technical thing about that somewhere else, it doesn't matter. Um, and then there's this wonderful commentary. People suddenly become interested in getting close to the Buddha through practice after growing old and feeling the approach of death. <laughs> right, you know. Uh, okay, all right. Um, Every day unknowingly sow seeds of karma and the fruit appears at death. In his world context, is he meaning all for the rebirth to come? Uh, probably, probably. Um, but, you know, I'm not him. I don't know for sure. Overall, not a comforting text to read. It's not supposed to be. Abounds in warnings. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, notice footnote 3 to chapter 3 and chapter 52. Let's see, footnote 3 to chapter 3. Footnote 3 to chapter 3. Let's see what that is. Footnote 3. Ignorance, in Sino-Korean, literally mind darkness. According to the discourse on the awakening of faith in the Mahayana, there are two dimensions to ignorance. One is fundamental ignorance, which is any arising of thought that obscures insight into the nature of reality as it is, or dharma. The other kind of ignorance might be termed derivative ignorance, which is the minute, crude, delusional thought subsequently springing out of that fundamental obscuration. Right. Um, and then... In fifth, uh, well, we already talked about the habitual thinking while well, chanting, and then this person wrote, habitual thinking, is there any other kind? Good question. <laughs> I hope there's other kinds. Um, yeah, my thinking's always changing, so it's not stuck. Um, phrasing in footnote three to chapter three seems to leave open the possibility of thinking that does not distort the Dharma reality as it is. That's a really good question, which points to an interesting issue. Um, the sixth patriarch uh, said that thinking is the problem. And he's not the only one who said that, that any kind of thinking is the problem. And yet thinking is also a tool. So the question is, how do you use this? How do you not get attached, actually it was, he said attachment to thinking. So I correct myself, attachment to thinking is the problem. So you use thinking as a tool, but you don't get attached to it. And then the question of whether human beings or any other living creature can see reality as it is, that's a really good, interesting question that has to do with neurophysics and God knows what and what is time and how do we perceive space and all that stuff and I won't go into it. But um, yeah, there is a way to directly touch things, but it's not gonna be mediated through here. Um, talks of many skillful means, since skillful means are potentially infinite, also seems to leave open the possibility, bye Carol, also seems to leave open the path. Carol has to leave now. So goodbye, thank you. Um, also seems to leave open the possibility of thing that does not distort the Dharma. So we just talked about that. Um, if you're not attached to your thinking, it doesn't have to distort the Dharma. Our skillful means infinite. I don't know what infinite means in this context because our lives are finite. 
So even if they were infinite, would it matter? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, traditionally, it's 84,000, but that's just because it's a big number, although it's not that big. I mean, there are bigger numbers used in Buddhism, but yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, feed the Buddha to the dogs, number 85. So uh, that's, um, was it Unmun who said, if I had been around when, you know, when the Buddha wo was born and in his little baby ego, he says, oh, only, you know, in heavens above and the earth below, only I am holy. And then the response is, I would have fed him to the dogs. And there's actually a note on that so I can look it up and check that it really is Unmun, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, it is Unmun, Yunmen, yeah. So uh, that's what that's about. And um, 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 Hyungok's notes on the, on the Zen stories and stuff are pretty good. They're not nearly as extensive as Jorgensen, but um, yeah. Should we read the Compass of Zen then too? Jonathan, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, we we regularly we regularly have a class on Compass of Zen, and it takes about seventeen sessions to go through. And yes, we should have a class on Compass of Zen. But for a while, we're going to do some some other stuff. But please buy Compass of Zen and read it. It's a great book. If you haven't read Compass of Zen, it's really terrific. It's uh, Zen Master Sung San. Um, he what he insists on calling the Hinayana because it's the pre-Theravada, so he wants to call the Hinayana, and then uh, the Mahayana in general, and then Zen. He does not talk about Tibetan Buddhism because it doesn't relate to Zen. And, um, but anyway, so he, he, it really gives a very good overview of a large part of Buddhism. So it's a terrific book. And yes, eventually, maybe in six months or a year or something, we'll start another round of classes on Compass of Zen. This make, really makes me think of the Christian Gospels and how authorship of texts are not seen as being important. Exactly. It feels like in modern times that we've been, become focused on the ownership of words. Exactly. Um, so I have an article in Buddha Dharma on this. Um, it's called There Is No Author. And it quotes from... Um, it, it quotes from, uh, you know, uh, Roland Barthes and, you know, people like that. And it um, talks about hip hop and <laughs> everything like that. And um, yeah, and it's in Buddha Dharma. And I, I'm, I don't think it's on the web. I'm not sure if it's on the web. They, they don't tell me when they put things on the web. I have to look and see. But anyway, yeah, this, this is, this is definitely true. In fact, the, the, the Tibetans have this tradition where if somebody wrote something and they wanted people to pay attention to it, they would bury it and then dig it up a few years later and claim that it was a text that was like a thousand years old or something like that. Um, it's only really in the last few hundred years that the notion of, I wrote this and that's why you should pay attention to it, that that notion came up, it's usually like, oh, I, I didn't write this, someone else wrote that, that's why you should pay attention to it, you know? So, um, so yeah, this, this, um, this sort of collage technique is extremely important. And as I said, you know, it's not plagiarism, you have to really have absorbed this stuff so intimately in order to do something like this. It's, it's really very remarkable. Um, that he did that, so yeah. And then someone says, keep your hands close to your body. Um, <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> um, so it's been about an hour and I'm wondering if um, people would like to stick around for a little longer and maybe I can talk a little bit more about the background of the text and a few other things. Would that be amenable? Maybe for like another, okay, all right. So if you want to leave, you can leave. And if you want to stay, you can stay. Um, I think Sosan's biography is important here to give us a, a sense of the text. And, you know, I, I sent you the notes and, um, 
but it's important to understand this guy was a child prodigy. He was trained in the dominant Confucianism. He was, um, and you know, it's very similar to Zen Master Sung San. You know, he's studying for the exams, just like Zen Master Sung San was back when he was young, whatever Lee, uh, Lee was his uh, family name, um, was studying for philosophy, Western philosophy exams. And, you know, he meets, encounters a, a monk, a Buddhist monk, and, and uh, you know, the, the monk said to, uh, Zen Master Sung San's story is that the monk said to him, oh, you're reading Socrates. Well, who are you? Do you know who? Oh, no, he said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm reading Western philosophy. Um, you know, and Socrates used to go around and ask people, who are you or something like that. And, the, and then he said to the monk, do you know who you are? And the monk said, um, I know that the sky is blue and the tree is green. And Zen Master Sung San went, wow, I'm going to become a Buddhist, you know. And it's very similar here. So this precocious kid, he's sent to the main Confucian university at the age of 12. And then he encounters this, a monk who asks him if he wanted to pass the examination of the empty mind. And he goes, whoa, <laughs> you know. And um, so he started studying Buddhism and practicing Buddhism. And then um, he, it says that he awakened at the age of 15, but he would just have been studying sutras at this point. And then, um, but the importance of, of the inadequacy of sutra study and its importance, as we can see, are themes in his work. And this background that he had, I think, is very important for that. Um, he becomes a, an administrator of both the Zen school and the sutra school at a very young age. Um, and then he resigned these positions when he was 38. And then he wanders around teaching and practicing, tracked thousands of students, had 70 Dharma heirs. When he's 70, he's accused of um, insurrection and he manages to impress the king. And so then three years later, when the Japanese attack, um, he's asked to raise a monk army because where are you going to find a whole bunch of young men, right, in the monasteries? And you have to understand that uh, Buddhism had been really repressed by Confucians, so Confucianism and Confucian, Confucian rulers. So it was quite something to ask this monk army to defend the country, but he did. And he's famous for um, instructing the the person who was uh, doing the the peace treaty with Japan to take mercy on the Japanese troops. And he was well known that when his monk armies captured uh, Japanese troops, that they did not mistreat him, that they you know treated them with with respect and and courtesy. And so he became a national hero, and he's still a national hero in Korea. And then he returns to teaching and practicing, and he died in his early 80s while giving a Dharma talk. And then there's this apocryphal story where he looks up, he sees his portrait on, he sees his portrait on the wall of the uh, Dharma room, and he writes the following poem, 80 years ago, that was me, after 80 years, am I that? And that just gets my hackles raised because the arithmetic doesn't work. It wasn't a picture of him as a newborn or a toddler, which it would have had to have been. But anyway, and then he dies. Um, so that biography, the, that he's, you know, his parents die when he's young. So he has this experience of being an orphan. Then he's taken in by a very wealthy man. He's a child prodigy. He, um, has all these advantages. Then he becomes a Buddhist monk. Then, you know, a Buddhist monk in a time when there's some oppression of Buddhism, then he, in old age, he's, you know, then he's accused of, of um, insurrection, which is, you know, he could have been executed, but he wasn't, and then becomes friends with the king, and then, you know, so, the, the, you know, this kind of up and down, and, and it's turbulent times that he's living in, not quite as bad as Tang Dynasty China, but it's pretty bad, and so that's where this is coming from. Um, And as, as several of you pointed out, this, this kind of uncompromising nature of this text, I mean, he's really serious. He doesn't want you to slack off at all. It's very similar, you know, Dawi, uh, where he gets a lot of his stuff from Dawi. Um, and we all get a lot of our stuff in, in uh, any Lynchy school from Dawi. 
Um, so he, uh, it, it's the same uncompromising nature, Huang Po, the same way. These people, they, they don't want you to slack off for a minute. They want to remind you what's important. And their, their texts all read that way. They just want you to wake up, wake up, wake up. That's the point. Um, so I wanted to talk about something that none of you mentioned, but it's important, and that's the um, that's the ten move sicknesses, um, page twenty eight and twenty nine. And this is important because um, in any Kungan school. Whoops, oh, page 20, as number 20, page 20. Um, any Kongan school, um, when you're working on, on Kongans, and he uses Kongan and Wadu sort of interchangeably here, there are traps you can fall into. And so he lists 10 sicknesses in this practice. And I want to tell you the source. He's getting them uh, from Dawi, who listed eight, and then Chanul added another two. And I have extensive notes on which ones are which, but I'm not going to burden you with them. Um, but I want to, to talk, to read to you what they are, because I think it's important, not just in, in Kungan practice, but in the way that we approach any kind of knowledge, um, any kind of reading, any kind of trying to understand something. So there's trying to figure out the common using discriminative thought and just only discriminative thought. And anytime we rely only on that, we have a problem. There's seizing on the master's wordless teaching gestures such as raising his eyebrows or winking. So that's sort of is a two-edged. It's like you're imitating somebody. You don't really own it. You're just imitating somebody. And also it's a way of looking for approval. You're, you're um, mirroring someone, hoping that they approve of you. Uh, allowing to your, yourself to get caught by words and speech. So that's being caught on the surface. You're caught on the surface of things and you, you can't get past the surface of things. You're just caught on the surface just words and speech, and you can't see where they're pointing. Um, searching for proofs or evidence in the common. So that's sort of making things up, that you're sort of making up symbolism and metaphor and stuff like that that's not actually there, but you want to put it there because it makes it more interesting. Miming the shout or sudden expression of some masters if it were your own thing. That's the same as the raising eyebrows and stuff. Abandoning everything by falling into emptiness. Now, Sosan talks about that a lot in other contexts as well. The notion of, there's, there's one place where, uh, towards the end, where he talks about um, how simply saying that everything is empty and just saying, okay, I'm done, everything's empty. You know, and, and you, you, or even not saying I'm done, but just I'm going to rest in the emptiness. Rest in the emptiness. I'm rest, you know, you can't do that. So just falling into emptiness, not understanding, you know, emptiness and substance are the same. You know, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. You have to really attain that and not just fall into emptiness. Attempting to distinguish between conditions of existence or not existence. So that's this sort of overly analytical mind, thinking in terms of absolute nothingness. So that's very similar to falling into emptiness, except now you're thinking about it all the time. Knowing things in terms of logical reasoning, that's only logic, just logic, and not anything else. And impatiently expecting awakening. Those of us who've done um, long enough and whoever you are will depend what long enough means it might mean four hours it might mean 40 years uh retreats know that feeling of you know you're just sitting there and you just know you just know that any moment any moment any moment your mind will explode you know 
and you're just waiting and you're just waiting. You're just waiting for that moment when your mind will explode. You know, you, you already have it. You don't have to wait for anything, you know, but that, that feeling, you know, you're just any moment, any moment, it's going to come any moment, any moment, any moment, you know, that, yeah, it doesn't get you anywhere. So, um, so I wanted to talk about the 10 sicknesses because they're uh, kind of important. I also wanted to talk about, um, I should also ask, um, at this point, does anyone have any questions um, that you'd like to put in the, in the chat box? Or um, if, you, if you have a question um, right now, let me, let me see. Why don't you, we, we don't have that many people at this point. Stan, why don't you stop the recording for a section? for a session, a, a, a minute or whatever, at the record. So, um, so this one thing, we did actually already talk about it, but uh, we can talk about it again. Um, this one thing, um, it's basic to the Mahayana. It's fundamentally empty, which I think makes it possibly different from Taoism, but I don't know because I don't know Taoism. It can't be talked about. And yet here we are talking about it. And in some sense, the, um, the the um, path of Mirror of Zen is that it goes in this circle where we start with the one thing and then we go through, you know, the, the purpose of, of, the, of the teachings and the practice and all these different things. Then we come back at the end to the one thing. So Everything we do is manifest, is a manifestation of this one thing. But you really can't talk about it. So I guess that's the best I can do. So this one thing, it can't be spoken of. It's in, in standard Mahayana Buddhism, like in the awakening of faith, it's uh, sort of the ground, but also emptiness is the ground. So this one thing is also fundamentally empty. And this never born and never dies, which comes into, in and out of Sosan, you know, our true self is, never, is not born when we are born and never dies when we die. So that's a way of saying that we are not little marbles separate from each other we're all manifestations of one thing. It's in, you know, like Indra's net is another image for this. Um, but we can't get hooked onto, what does that mean? It's never born and never dies. Is it, you know, like a, a kind of really solid metal that'll last you know, even when there's no more universe, like what, you know, we can't get, get stuck on that. And, you know, what I didn't say before when I was talking about this, and um, I think what is, this is, you know, this teaching of don't know is really important here. And so using, you know, if you really want to have some, um, I don't want to say understanding. If you if you really want to look at this one thing, then the way to do it is to make it a practice. Just when you're sitting, what is this one thing? What is this one thing? What is this one thing with your breath? What is this one thing? And you just look at that and with a very strong don't know mind with a mind that's not analyzing it 
Just look at that and look at that and look at that and see what happens. And that's the best way to, to, um, to sort of come to grips with it, to attain it. And you'll notice that Sosa never, never, um, he never analyzes it. He just brings it up. So that's interesting. So thank you for your question. Okay, so I'll say again. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Jorgensen, Jorgensen talks about how the invading um, Japanese general was a megalomaniac. So when a, an army led by a megalomaniac is invading your country, you might take up arms. And you think about the suffering that's going to be caused if that army, the, the invading army wins. And yeah, so it's understandable that you might do that. And um, um, yeah, I'm saying goodbye to somebody who has to go. Um, and one of the wonderful things about Mahayana Buddhism is the recognition that there's room for everybody. So there's room for conscientious objector and there's room for, um, for a soldier. And you, whatever role you're playing, you need to do it in the most ethical way possible. So I'm not gonna judge Sosan. And if you wanna judge Sosan, go ahead. Okay, now turn the recording off. How can you not be patient? And how can you not be compassionate? So patience isn't passive, as we know, but I just want to say it clearly. Um, patient means that we're not being pulled around by our desire and our anger and our ignorance. We're not being pulled around by our, our emotions. We're not being pulled around by misunderstandings. We're not acting prematurely. We're waiting until things are ripe and ready and then we act. That's patience. And um, if we truly see our connection with others, then how can we not be compassionate? And the urgency is interesting because Sosan, he presents this urgency on an individual level. You know, what kind of body do you want to be reborn? And you know, what, you know, what is your fate? But in fact, this urgency is not about us. This urgency is, and not even just about human beings, this urgency is for this whole universe. And it's to save the suffering of this whole, to, um, to um, alleviate the suffering of this whole universe. That's what this urgency is really about. So he talks about in one place, you know, a, a common Buddhist trope of someone whose hair is on fire but it's not just your hair that's on fire. It's everyone's hair that's on fire. Even Blake's and Don's. <laughs> well, Blake has a beard that could be on fire. Uh, so when, when we understand the urgency as not just about us, then the compassion automatically becomes part of it. And the patience um, also, because if we rush too fast, then we're going to blow it. That most of what we do blows it. And to, to really, um, to pay attention enough to know when to act and to know when not to act is very difficult. And that's our job. So thank you for your question. Did that answer it? Okay. And now please stop recording. Okay. I have some uh, sort of tactical 
notes um, that I actually don't think I need to give. Um, I do want to say something about the translation. It's a very, this translation is very, um, it's very clear and it's written beautifully. Um, but there, he's translating from, so Hyangak is translating from a contemporary Korean translation of, I'm not sure whether it's the, an older Korean translation or a Chinese, the original Chinese. So, you know, they're, they're, two, they're the long version of Sosan and then he came out with a short version because the long version was too much for people to deal with. So there, there's all these levels. And um, it's in some places, It, there's in many places it it sort of glosses over things, whereas Jorgensen is impossible to read because he doesn't gloss over anything, and so you just can't read him. I mean, you it's a very very scholarly text and it can't just be read. Um, but I think it's important when when we read the mirrors and to understand that this text is mediated. It's a wonderful text, but it's it's being mediated a lot, and um, in particular, the the contrast between uh, Kyo or Sutra school and um, Son or Zen school is made possibly more. It's is made more uh, distinctly than it should be, and so. Um, we should kind of open our minds to that, that the, the distinction is not as strong in Sosan as it seems to in, you know, Sosan's other versions of Sosan that it seems to be. And um, what I ended up, I had a review in primary point a long time ago. And what I wrote is what is needed is a version of Sosan's seminal work which draws on Jorgensen's immense scholarship without such bristling detail and provides a graceful translation close to Sosan's 16th century text. Given the daunting nature of the task of requiring familiar, familiar, familiarity with 16th century Korean usage of Chinese, immersion in Buddhist practice and philosophy, access to primary materials and financial support during the necessarily lengthy process, I'm not holding my breath. So we have a choice of imperfections here. And I highly recommend this version of imperfection, but I also um, encourage you to understand um, that um, it is in its own way imperfect. Um, and I wanna thank you all very much. And any feedback of um, how this class went, especially technologically, I would appreciate. You can just send an email to me personally if you have my email address or the Zen Center. And because we're going to have more classes like this. And anybody have any last thing they want to say? Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.